My brave lad, he sleeps in his faded coat of blue. In a lonely grave alone lies the heart that beats so true. They will find him and know him amongst the good and true. When a robe of white is given for that faded coat of blue. No more the blue. Welcome to War of the Rebellion, Stories of the Civil War. I am your host, Leon Mauser, and this is a reading of the regimental history under the Maltese Cross, Antietam to Appomattox, the Loyal Uprising in Western Pennsylvania, 1861 to 1865, Campaign's 155th Pennsylvania Regiment, narrated by the rank and file. And we are continuing at Chapter 11, The Battle of the Wilderness. Fire in the Woods Adds to Horrors of War To add to the horrors of this battlefield, the woods took fire, and many of the dead and wounded left between the lines were cremated. This, no doubt, was the fate of many accounted for as missing. So dense were the thickets through which the two battle lines had advanced that, in falling back rapidly, Many of the men had their flesh so lacerated and their clothes so torn that from their bloody appearance they were supposed to be wounded. When the gloom of the night had cast its mantle upon this field of slaughter, and trenching began on the newly formed lines and was steadily carried on all night, the 155th constructed entrenchments at three different places as they were shifted from point to point. Before daylight on May 6th, however, Griffin's division with the 155th, left their newly constructed breastworks and advanced to their old position of the day before. The Confederates were just as busily occupied in building entrenchments at the same time as was Ayer's brigade during the night. In lulls of picket firing, the 155th could hear the sharp ring of the enemy's axes and the falling of trees. Very heavy skirmishing took place at intervals during the 6th, and that night the 155th being deployed as skirmishers, were moved from point to point in the woods, the locations being indicated by Colonel Pearson, who whistled the bugle calls on the handle of his riding whip. While on this skirmish line, the regiment could hear entrenching operations being carried on, both in the direction of the enemy and in the rear of the regiment. Toward morning, the skirmish line formed by the 155th was located in front or at the edge of a clearing, the men being posted by twos at close intervals. As day dawned, the advance of the Confederates to attack could be plainly seen by the skirmishers through the young green foliage. Nearer and nearer they came. The 155th held its fire and watched the Confederates halt and straighten their line. Then, when the bugles of the enemy sounded the charge, the firing began. The Confederate officers could be heard giving commands. Suddenly, the enemy's solid battle line were upon the 155th skirmishers, who opened fire at close quarters and then fell back. The other regiments of Ayer's brigade, during the night, had constructed heavy breastworks, which were well manned. Before the 155th skirmishers could fall back into the breastworks in the rear, a heavy fire of musketry and canister was opened right through the ranks upon the enemy from the Union troops in the rear. So severe was this fire that it quickly repulsed the Confederates, except some of the most advanced who rushed into the skirmish line of the 155th and lay down with them to escape the fire of the Union troops. They were nearly all taken prisoners. As soon as the enemy retreated, the fire slackened, and the 155th skirmishers were ordered back into the breastworks. Colonel Pearson, temporarily relieved, Upon reaching the works, Colonel Pearson, in command of the regiment, had a heated colloquy with General Ayers over this firing into the 155th by other regiments of this brigade, in which the colonel used language deemed disrespectful to General Ayers. The result was that Colonel Pearson was immediately removed from command and placed under arrest, remaining so until the army had crossed the James River. Lieutenant Colonel John Ewing, in the meantime, took command 
and remained in charge of the regiment throughout the campaign until after the charge on the 18th of June at Petersburg. No formal charges were ever preferred against Colonel Pearson, and the matter was arranged by the transfer, some weeks later, of the 155th to General Sweetser's brigade in Griffin's division, 5th Corps. To resume the narrative, on being ordered out to the skirmish line to relieve the 155th, the 20th Maine left good fires burning in the rear of the breastworks they had been occupying. The 155th boys were not slow in utilizing these fires for the purpose of making coffee. One fire composed of a pile of rails was surrounded by perhaps a dozen men watching their cups of coffee come to a boil, when a 12-pound solid shot from the Confederate lines struck the end of the rails, scattering rails, cups, and coffee in all direction. Fortunately, however, injuring no one, as the only convenient place for procuring water was under dangerous shell fire from the enemy. It was very disappointing to have such an accident happen at such a time, and induced strong language from some of the boys. The 20th Maine relieved the 155th as skirmishers, and the latter took possession of the place behind the breastworks previously occupied by the former when the regiment proceeded to prepare the first cooked food they had had for 48 hours. The 20th Maine, Colonel J. L. Chamberlain, in advancing to the skirmish line, which had been established by the 155th during the night, had a severe fight with the enemy and suffered serious losses. A sergeant, who was somewhat late in gathering up his accoutrements, followed his regiment quickly, and in ten minutes thereafter was carried back dead, a shot having going straight through his chest. The grief of his brother, who helped carry him back, was pitiable. May 7th was spent in the woods skirmishing and, in military language, feeling the lines of the enemy, with occasionally heavy outbursts of musketry and artillery. After Observations In the engagement that took place on the 5th of May, 1864, the men of the same army could not see each other at a distance of more than a few yards, and of course could not see the enemy at a greater distance. Regiments struggling through this mass of obstructions necessarily lost their bearings, and would suddenly come upon each other and upon similar bodies of the enemy. All direction being lost, there would be desperate fighting for the possession of ground neither side knowing how much or how little from a military point of view the possession sought or defended was worth. It was impossible for corps commanders to handle their troops with any cooperation, even brigades became broken up so that they could not reinforce any body of troops or assist in taking advantage of temporary successes. To add to the perils of the fighting, several times fires broke out in the inflammable brush and dead leaves, literally smothering with smoke the combatants, and often seeking out the wounded who had helplessly sought shelter. Colonel D.T. Jenkins of the 146th New York, with many others of that regiment, after being mortally wounded, became enveloped in the prevailing conflagration and were last seen in the flames. Ayers, 2nd Brigade, and Bartlett's 3rd Brigade of Griffin's Division held their new positions until 3 p.m., when the 5th Corps lines were readjusted in their original positions, the enemy having fallen back to their breastworks from which their deadly attack had been made. The recovery of the lost ground of the 5th Corps and especially of Ayers' brigade, in the afternoon by the movement to straighten the lines to the original position, revealed a scene of distress and misery rarely surpassed in any other war. On this ground, thus retaken between the lines, were strewn the bodies of several thousand soldiers of both enemy and foe who fell in the awfully close range and frequently hand-to-hand -hand struggle. At least a thousand wounded soldiers, unable to move, also were discovered, and many of the 155th thus recovered, describing the advance of the enemy over the ground in dispute, and the falling back of the line of the attacking column of Ayers' brigade, averred that the enemy, passing over them for dead, had robbed their persons of everything of value, and carried off knapsacks and contents in the most heartless manner. Pathetic Incidents 
in the hand-to-hand -hand encounter and stand of Air's Brigade, in the advance and the wilderness, the 155th Regiment, lost in prisoners and killed and wounded, many of its most valued and beloved comrades. Sergeant Harry R. Campbell, of Company B, a most popular and genial comrade, noted in camps as an accomplished musician, was captured in the struggle with the enemy, and destined to become a martyr in Libby and Andersonville prisons, there to survive eleven months from the horrible treatment, dying at Annapolis within a week after his exchange. He had become too much dilapidated to journey on to the loving friends and relatives in Allegheny, Pennsylvania, who were unfortunately kept in ignorance of his exchange. Private John Hunter of Company E, who, in the midst of the fray, was clubbed into insensibility by a confederate in the thicket, and captured and taken prisoner, also died at Annapolis, his experience at Andersonville having made him a physical wreck. His death at Annapolis occurred a few days after his exchange. Private Jacob S. Friend of Company E, after being wounded in the shoulder and wrist in two places, was left for dead on this battlefield. From the shock, and on reviving, was taken prisoner by the retreating enemy, as the latter fell back over the same ground to the earthworks. Private Friend, at the same time of his capture, was the youngest and most delicate in physique of any in the ranks of the company, but he survived the horrors of Andersonville's treatment, and was exchanged after eleven months' captivity. It was many years after the war, before the terrible effects of his long imprisonment were eradicated. Sergeant Hugh W. McKimsey, a sturdy, small-sized man, in this fight at close range had an opportunity to display his well-known pugilistic abilities. He got into a hand-to-hand -hand encounter and wrestle with an able-bodied confederate whom he downed on the first round. Hardly had McKimsey accomplished this feat, however, when he was struck by a clubbed musket in the hands of another confederate and knocked insensible. Private Jacob S. Friend of Company E, who was standing next to McKimsey, and who himself was soon after struck insensible by the bullets from the enemy and taken prisoner, declared that he actually believed all the time of his imprisonment that the blow thus received by McKimsey had killed him. After recovering from the shock, the brave Sergeant McKimsey, finding that the enemy had fallen back, made a beeline for the new rallying ground of the 155th Regiment and Ayers Brigade, surviving to participate in all subsequent campaigns of the regiment. Corporal Michael B. Lemon of Company E also received in this day's action very severe wounds, disabling him for life. The 155th Regiment quickly recovered the ground thus lost in the afternoon and brought Corporal Lemon again within the Union lines, in reach of the stretcher-bearers who carried him back to the field hospital. Color Corporal John H. Mackin of Company F who was among the first to receive a wound at the Battle of Gettysburg, was again unfortunate while serving with the colors, receiving in this action a more severe wound in the left shoulder, and almost the same place as his former wound. Many will recall a remark often made by Mackin on his return to the camp after recovering from the Gettysburg wound, that, quote, lightning rarely strikes twice in the same place, unquote. Corporal Mackin was sent to Washington General Hospital, and there died a month later from the effects of his wound. Horatio S. Harnish, of Company H, from Rimmersburg, Clarion County, in the thickest of the fray, the opening of the Battle of the Wilderness, on this first day was instantly killed, in the advance on the charge of Humphrey's division, leading the forlorn hope against the stone wall on Mary's Heights at Fredericksburg. Horatio S. Harnish fell severely wounded and was necessarily absent from the regiment some months. But as the earliest opportunity, he rejoined the command in time to participate in the great battles of Chancellorsville, Gettysburg, and in the Mine Run campaign, but fell a victim of the enemy's fierce fire on the 5th of May. John Griffith of Company H on this day was on the skirmish line detailed from the 155th, commanded by Captain Lawlin. 
when the enemy, in response to the fire of these skirmishers, returned the fire, thus opening the battle with a terrific attack along the Union line. Colonel A. L. Pearson, commanding the regiment, which by reason of the dense undergrowth was not far in the rear of the skirmishers, rode along the lines and ordered his men to cease firing and to hug Mother Earth closely until the firing ended. The enemy, however, advanced over the skirmishers in superior numbers, driving them back into the regimental ranks. Griffith received a severe wound in his right shoulder from the enemy's fire, after which he remembered nothing for a period. On reviving, he found himself a prisoner, and although very weak and faint from the loss of blood, was sent to the rear of the Confederate army. Griffith endured all the horrors of Andersonville for the following eleven months. Private Harnett, E. Meeker of Company H, was wounded in the first day's fighting in the wilderness. He was taken prisoner and died a few months later in Andersonville prison. The great battle of the wilderness, commencing on the 5th and lasting throughout the 6th and 7th of May, 1864, was a most remarkable struggle. It was a contest for two days and nights on lines approximately four miles in length by the Union forces comprising 130,000 troops in battle columns against the Confederate forces of 65,000 men, also lined up for battle on the defensive. The position of advances gained or lost by either army as a result of the severe fighting in the wilderness on the 5th, 6th, and 7th of May carried with them no significance or military advantage. Death of General Alexander Hayes the loss in the action of the wilderness of General Alexander Hayes of Pittsburgh, who was mortally wounded while commanding a brigade of the 2nd Corps, reached the 155th Regiment while also fighting in the same bewildering jungle near where General Hayes fell. The general, being personally known to many of the 155th Regiment, the news of his death, for the first time being cast in additional gloom over the regimental ranks, General Hayes had served with the Army of the Potomac with his organization and in every great battle in the Peninsula Campaign and at Antietam under McClellan, Fredericksburg, Chancellorsville, and more especially rendering most distinguished services in the famous Peach Orchard at Gettysburg. This career had earned for him the highest military reputation and promotion to a brigadier generalship for his gallant services in the field. General Hayes was a student at West Point with General Grant and subsequently served with him in the Mexican War. On visiting Pittsburgh in 1867, the Lieutenant General Grant, in company with Captain David Shields, who had served as ADC on General Hayes' staff, visited the grave of General Hayes in Allegheny Cemetery and paid an affectionate tribute to the memory of his classmate. General Wadsworth's body fell into the hands of the enemy at the wilderness and received the most tender care and marks of respect from General Lee. General Wadsworth lived long enough after he fell to express to his captors the patriotic sentiment, quote, I feel consoled that at my advanced age the mortal wound I have received has simply cut off but a few years of the life left me for service to my country. Unquote. General Lee, as a tribute of respect and esteem, sent a flag of truce through the lines with an escort conveying General Wadsworth's body to General Grant's headquarters, where the General's son, Lt. James S. Wadsworth, Jr., who was serving on his father's staff, received the body, and with other officers on leave of absence, escorted the remains to the home of General Wadsworth in the Gene C. Valley in the state of New York. An incident occurred a few weeks later in the campaign which revealed the public spirit and foresight and great consideration of General Wadsworth for his troops. It was found, when nearing Cold Harbor, that the quartermaster's supply of army shoes for the troops of the V Corps had run out, and that much time would be lost in securing fresh consignments from Washington. The forced marching and the fording of many streams by Grant's troops in the campaign was so severe on shoes that many of the soldiers were actually barefooted by the time they reached the vicinity of Cold Harbor. General Wadsworth's division, having suffered from a scarcity of shoes on former campaigns, the general, anticipating the possibility of this again occurring, previous to the opening of Grant's campaign to Richmond, at his own expense, 
purchased, and had delivered to his division train in the Fifth Corps a number of boxes of shoes. These boxes were open for delivery at Cold Harbor. Many of the 155th Pennsylvania Volunteers will recall the joy of George P. Fulton, Regimental Quartermaster Sergeant, on receiving for distribution the regiment's share of these shoes from the stock so considerably provided by the lamented General Wadsworth. What a chapter that was. And we'll carry on with chapter 12 next week. I think so far this has been my favorite of the battle chapters I've read, even though it grows more grotesque the longer I read this regimental history. I'm going to go ahead and get some news out of the way. I revamped my website. Please visit it. Please. It actually looks tolerable now. Uh, on top of that, you should be able to find things a little bit easier. And I'm also going to have different subsections where you can look at things based on of certain tags. So by all means, come check it out. The website will be divided up among announcements, releases, other book readings and Patreon news, music, poetry, and regimental readings. But I don't have all of that up yet, but I've got like the core fixed, I should say. It won't be officially ready until August when I actually start producing more content on a regular basis. When I get back from my hike, um, I'll finally just have like a lot of time just to sit down and make some things. But my idea, I'm going to spend a lot of time making content for you guys on top of what I already do for the podcast. So I'm really excited for that. I do have a Patreon subscription now. And my idea is that the Patreon will be for other Civil War related books to read from soldiers who wrote their own personal books or escaped slaves who wrote about their experiences. I'm really excited. And of course, there's also going to be a Discord for fellow Civil War fans to be able to chat, talk, and game, have movie nights and that kind of thing together. So, pretty excited. As for the news for my hike, I will begin releasing updates this week about that. I, I did get an email that asked me why, <laughs> and it's a pretty silly reason, but it's because I want to. I mean, also partly it's to show people what veterans went through at the time, but it's pretty much because I want to. And it's also just kind of fun, right? <laughs> All right, let's dig into my notes. There's there's just been so much that's been written about the Battle of Wilderness. There's like a lot of other things out there. I'm going to link you to them. If you want to read about them or check them out, by all means, go ahead. I'm also going to have some photos up from the book on this post. So come check it out. All right. Officially, note time. My heart hurts for the soldiers who had to endure this three days of nightmare fuel being burned alive by approaching fires as you lay wounded nightmare fuel being part of an army locked in a death grip in a forest so thick it's ripping your clothes to shreds nightmare fuel soldiers fighting in hand-to-hand -hand combat and you stumbling across thousands of their bodies nightmare fuel what an event to endure right at that point, you're just hoping you make it out of alive. Also, the 155th being overwhelmed and having to fall back and then regaining its ground was like, yeah, one for the good guys. But it had to have stung their pride a little bit, right? They just got those uniforms. They just proved their kind of metal and close combat kind of thing. That's what they get them for. The Zouave bayonet drill. But overall, this whole chapter has been an insane event for these people to go through. It's been nuts. Then, to be placed as skirmishers, as a regiment, in front of everybody else, only for Don to bring light to you of the Confederate army, like, on its way to you, right? Then you gotta run back for your own line and they open fire with canisters and rifle volleys. And you're trapped between the two. Ugh. Man, these guys did not have a great time at the Battle of Wilderness. I'll tell you that much. Oh, but you know what? Colonel Pearson for standing up to it for his boys. Yeah. 
good job, man. Like, like, what do they tell him? Like, hey, guys, if they're in front of him, if there's a friendly in front of you, don't shoot him. <laughs> like, what? Um, and the part where the cannonball comes in and hits the the fire that was making all those dudes coffee. For like the fence rail, the fence rail fire. Oh, man. I'm glad no one was hurt because that's a funny story. And I'm sure every guy involved, if he made it out alive of the war, told that story at every chance he got. Uh, I'm also glad that the Richmond history is giving us little stories from each soldier about what happens to him in this part in the conflict. Like Mackin getting shot in the same place in the shoulder, saying like lightning doesn't strike in the same place twice or rarely strikes, and then he gets shot there. I would have preferred him to survive because that would have been a great story to tell. But so, you know what that means? Drink one for Mackin. <laughs> Give him a toast. Um, reading about all of the generals who were dying, you know, they're right on the front line. They're directing troops to and fro. You know, their job is to direct corps commanders or is to direct division commanders, regimental commanders. So a general dying, it happens. But the entire time they were talking about it in this book, all I could think of is like, then what are the Russians doing right now then? Because they've lost like seven generals. And when I think of taking lots of casualties from a conflict, it's not Ukraine. It's the American Civil War. Like That's how bad they are. Anyway, that's all I could think about when I was reading about General Wadsworth. So I just thought I'd share it with you because my brain is crazy. Uh, but his foresight in buying shoes for his men is something you lose with General, right? All of that knowledge and experience gets thrown out the window and somebody new gets promoted to it. And I bet that person did not buy shoes. <laughs> all right. That's the end of my rambling today. Stay on the lookout on my website for content. Come check out my content at rebellionstories.com. I'll see you there. There's also a link to my Patreon. Not that it doesn't have anything on it yet, but, you know, it felt like really important to getting that done. All right. Have a great week. I'll see you guys next week. Have a great week. Bye-bye. When a robe of white is given for that faded coat of blue, no more the bugle calls the weary one. Rest, noble spirit, in thy grave alone. They will find you and know you amongst the good and true. When a robe of white is given for that faded coat of blue. He cried, give me water and just one little crumb, and my mother, she will bless you through all the years to come. Go tell my sweet sister, so gentle, good, and true, that I'll meet her up in heaven in my faded coat of blue. No more the bugle calls the weary one. Rest, noble spirit, in thy grave alone. They will find you and know you amongst the good and true. When a robe of white is given for that 